Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Um, this is always a scary thing. The bar is so high, these craft talks. I would just like to really push repeat and let them all play again for you. Um, or maybe think of it as you've seen it done really well, and, and now you're going to see how not to do one. <laughs> Um, because I feel that I have stood at this podium and said the same thing over and over um, many times. It's, it's like being a witch every Halloween and just <laughs> deciding are you going to wear the black turtleneck or the black t-shirt. Um, <laughs> because I feel as a writer that, that I just have a few things I believe strongly and have to say, and I keep repeating them, I believe that you'll never be as smart as your subconscious. I believe there's no substitute for real time. I do believe if it's not one thing, it's your mother. <laughs> and I believe that there's no place like home. The writer Barry Hanna once said that Southern children are nostalgic by age seven. But, but I tend to think that really it's children at large um, coming into a sense of self and who they are. And lately I've been thinking a lot about children, I think, and memory. I think having a mother with Alzheimer's has led me to view it all um, on a very different level. But I've been thinking a lot lately as I watch these children in the news too, um, bits and pieces of knowledge, the linguistic capability we're all born with, that we could speak any language fluently. We're born such that we could be dropped anywhere in the world and do just fine. And then over time and exposure, we lose that ability. I've been thinking a lot of the Hebrew um, myth of the angel Layla, who, who picks a young soul pre-birth and educates that person about everything that can happen in the life up ahead, all the rewards, all the punishments, every possibility. And then at the moment you're born, this is why you have a philtrum. She touches you and you forget. And, and all of life up ahead is about recovering all that you once knew and, and it giving new meaning. And so somehow the, the journey of being a mother and having raised children still, um, even though they're grown, coupled with my own mother bending back to that place, very like childhood, it has all... Um, sort of come together for me and uh, let's see I'm supposed to go to part A see this is where it's all or, um, disorganized see what did I say here part oh I'm more and more aware of how one traveling the road my mother is on merges with that earliest path it's a coming back into that place not unlike childhood the filter fades, and once again, language is on and off the tongue without consideration to the world around us. Fears are expressed, whether rational or not. I once got a doll for Christmas, and I hated her immediately. <laughs> I can't say why. It was just something about her eyes. It was very unusual for me to reject a doll. I love dolls, but I named her Fire Doll, and I hid her in the back of the closet and never played with her. Bad juju. I don't know what it was. We feared the dark or someone under the bed. We grow up to learn what others have endured, and we feel lucky to have had a simpler fear. But in the moment, fear is fear, and it looms with all dark possibilities. My mother, now almost 89, and in and out of dementia, will say, don't leave me, don't leave me, just as my children did when not ready to sleep, just as I once did. So I've been thinking about all the capabilities we have when we're first born, and that very cute thing newborns do, the Morrow reflex, this. 
um, which is the only innate fear of response that humans are born with, the fear of being separated from one's mother. It's a survival instinct. And all other fear responses are learned. Children automatically the products and victims of whatever adult world they're born into. It's been hard in recent months not to think of such separations, partings and grief that will have completely changed young lives forever, changing their stories. Home, that's where I always began and where I always return. I offer it to my students at the beginning of each term. What comes to mind when you hear that word home? What images and words and memories? Chances are there are objects and moments you return to again and again without even realizing, like a homing pigeon, yet another effing bird. <laughs> Magneto reception, detecting that field that continues to pull you back into a place. Home is both physical and emotional, concrete and abstract. Originally, my topic was assembly required because I always find myself in that place, this place, with many parts spread around me and a time of great bewilderment about how to put it all together. Unfortunately, as you can see, I didn't figure that lecture out, so it didn't help me with this one. Um, but fortunately for you, Adrian is indeed um, lecturing on structure tomorrow. So I will be here. Um, but instead today, I choose to bring myself back to that favorite topic of childhood, home, and memory, and how we as writers come to the page with a wealth of knowledge and material simply by way of those earliest experiences. I've always thought that eight was the magic age where we really, you know, hunker down and start pulling it all into focus. I heard Ann Tyler recently on NPR talking about her new no novel. Pretty sure she said 10. Flannery O'Connor simply said by adolescence. In preparation, I was thinking of works that have made a huge and lasting impression on me as a writer. And I realized I've always been drawn to those childhood um, characters. Writers who have affected me, Carson McCullers, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter and the Member of the Wedding, Agee's A Death in the Family, William Maxwell's So Long, See You Tomorrow, Ernest Gaines' The Sky is Gray, Early Updike Stories, Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank. McCullers wrote, often as not, we are homesick most for the places we have never known. Many of her characters are the misfits, most of them, in fact, those searching for their homes or where they might feel they belong. In the opening of Member of the Wedding, it goes like this, it, that powerful it, happened that green and crazy summer when Frankie was 12 years old. This was the summer when for a long time she had not been a member. She had become an unjoined person and hung around in doorways, and she was afraid. If you know the, the novel and then play, she wants to go with her brother and his bride, um, proclaiming, they are the we of me. I think I was supposed to skip to this part, and I didn't. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm kind of weaving this, this essay I wrote about my mother um, to, to give it the fragmentation of dementia as if I needed that. So, so just, just please know that that's part of this essay to give you the experience. It's called, Are You My Mother? Are you my mother? I'm your daughter. Daughter? I have a daughter? You have two. Am I married? Yes, thank the Lord. <laughs> Many of my conversations with my mother begin this way and have for several years now. She has dementia and we're never sure what a visit will bring. A groggy, inwardly turned old woman who will not hold her head up 
or a lively, fast-talking hall monitor greeting everyone who passes, usually with the exuberant kindness as she would have dispensed in the vestibule of the First Baptist Church a decade ago and the many years prior to that. Hello there, sweetie. How are you today? Then just as easily she will slip into another realm that's common in this new existence, but completely foreign to her old one. Where'd you get such a big tail? God, I'd do something about that. And look at that one. I often think of those old topsy-turvy dolls with her changing moods, one minute smiling and cheerful and the next angry and saying things she never would have uttered in her other life. Sometimes I'm a long-dead cousin or her grandmother. Sometimes I've, I'm even myself. But more and more our roles are reversed, and I've found that the easiest thing to do is walk in and adjust to wherever she is. Mama, she calls. Yes, I'm here. Some days I'm simply part of the unknown. Your name is S-H-I-T. She often spells things. You must be thinking of someone else. <laughs> well, then I'll call you Cooter or Crocker. Okay. Who named you Cooter? You did, I guess. You're my mother. Sometimes in the midst of some kind of nonsensical banner, it is as if a shade lifts and for a split second she's there the woman who would have only spelled an expletive and then only when pushed to the very limit of tolerance. Like her mother before her, you knew she was at the end of her rope if you heard something like, Jesus, God, Jesus, invoking greater powers when not in church or saying the blessing meant you better scatter until it passed or you would be out at the ligustrum bush picking your own switch. <laughs> Sometimes the shade lifts. I wouldn't name a child Cooter, and we laugh. Men don't last long. Every woman I know who had one had him die. A sorry one might last longer than a good one, but I don't know. <laughs> I'll come back. The, the writer Dorothy Allison has said, write the story that you were always afraid to tell. I swear to you, there is magic in it, and if you show yourself naked for me, I'll be naked for you. That kind of courage and freedom to name and show the vulnerabilities allows the reader to open up and respond in a very similar way with their own memories. Allison goes on to say, as writers, as revolutionaries, tell the truth. Your truth in your own way, right to your fear. Her character Bone and Bastard Out of Carolina says, I wanted my life back, my mama, but I knew I would never have that. The child I had been was gone with the child she had been. We were new people. My mother was born in 1929 in Lumberton, North Carolina, as was my dad. They grew up just blocks from one another, and though they didn't begin dating until they were 16, were always in school together and friends. In fact, they often told how on the first day of first grade, their mothers walked together to take them to school. Then at the end of the day, Melba, my mother, was crying because she couldn't remember her way, and my dad told her he knew where her home was and he would help get her there. He liked to say he had been doing that ever since, but the truth is they took turns finding the best way home. And now I find myself really hoping that he's hovering and waiting for a repeat performance when the time comes. Did your daddy die? Yes. What happened? Lung cancer. Was I there? Every minute to the end. I've often thought that if there is a sliver of grace to be pulled from that gnarled up tangle of dementia, it is that little bit of time given to loved ones to fully appreciate the scope of a whole life while the individual is still there and breathing, and ne every now and then, for the briefest second, visible. 
Do you know who I am? Of course, you're my daughter, Jill. I am, and I'm proud of you. Why? You're a good mother. Well, I'm glad. I always wanted to be. I want to make vegetable soup like Grandma made. Can you help me? Sure. Get a big ham bone and boil it for a really long time. Oh, okay, great. It's a good day. And then what? Then just go around your house and throw whatever trinkets you can find into the pot. <laughs> My dad struggled with clinical depression at a time when people didn't talk about it. I think many viewed it as a weakness and something that a person could just buck up and handle. The young me has memories of us visiting him in the hospital on an Easter Sunday. Someone had offered to drive us, and my sister and I were all dressed up. Our dad came out onto the lawn in a bathrobe with the card he had bought for us there in the hospital gift shop. I remember running up and down a hill, getting hot and sweaty, and at the end of it all being told to wave goodbye and counting up the floors on the brick building to where my dad waved from a window covered in wire mesh. I don't recall many specifics during that time. I know my mother told me that I focused and worried in ways that prompted her to talk to a psychiatrist. Apparently, I had heard her tell my sister she didn't have her lunch money for school, meaning the correct change, and I interpreted it to mean we had no money at all. One of the doctors my mother worked with, a pediatrician, suggested she go to the bank and get lots of change, fill her purse with it all, and then send me to get something. I have no memory of the ecstasy she described to me. What I remember is her telling me the story with great pride and ending with, it worked. In fact, she teased that it might have worked too well because I've never been a very good saver. But what I marvel at looking back is all that she was able to manage at that time. She was the only one working, and she was the one maintaining the home, and she was the one who noticed a problem that needed attention. You're way too old to wear your hair that way, she says often. Well, I like it. I like your hair real, real short. I know you do. Do you really think it looks good that way? I think many women of my mother's generation thought it was a bad thing to compliment your children. I'm not sure why praise was not the first card drawn. Why wouldn't it be? But perhaps it was all tied up with pride and how that goeth before falls and all kinds of Bible speak my mother and I disagreed on fairly early, though I was careful not to say too much. One of my earliest reckonings of our differences was knowing that I needed to hide little things important to me that I didn't want thrown or given away. She could guilt you in a second to give your things to those less fortunate and figuring out ways to get out of going to things like training union, which I found depressing. I think a lot of it had to do with the clothes you had to wear to church, the starch and the itch and the hard shoes. And I remember being all but stripped down to a pair of Buster Brown underwear in the back seat on the way home, barefooted and relieved to get away from it all. I remember promising myself that I would never make my children do that, and I would never switch them or make them wash their mouths out with soap. Recently, I arrived, and my mother was very upset, crying like a little girl, and she told me that her mother had whipped the tar out of her. Why? I asked. I don't know. Well, that wasn't fair, I said. No, she agreed. That should never happen. Have you ever had a whipping? <laughs> yes, I said. <laughs> you have? Yes. <laughs> Who whipped you? You did. <laughs> You're my mother. Oh, I'm so sorry. If we get to go back, let's never do that again. Okay. Now I've got to follow my directions and say where it goes back to. Right to the fear, Dorothy Allison says. 
Dickens said that there is nothing so fiercely felt by children as injustice. The writer William Maxwell said that it's deprivation that leads people to write. He lost his mother at the age of 10. I love this quote regarding so long, see you tomorrow. I meant for it to be the story of someone else's tragedy, but the narrative weight is evenly distributed between the rifle shot on the first page and my mother's absence. Now I have nothing more to say about the death of my mother, I think, forever, but it was a motivating force in four books. If my mother turns up again, I will be astonished. I may even have to tell her to go away. Fear, injustice, deprivation. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, the opening of Little Women. Or Toni Morrison's Picola Breed Love in the Bluest Eye, Deprived of Blue Eyes, but more deprived of a safe home. The fears, the injustices. I've already mentioned Anne Frank, but I, I, it never ceases to amaze me looking back, not just at the diary, but tales from the secret annex, all the essays and short stories she wrote at such an early age with full intention of publishing them. And, and already the longing for the school days and friends and funny little stories and the ongoing hope of looking forward to being back there um, and being re reunited with all of the fun times. There's Kay Gibbons, Ellen Foster, Huckleberry Finn, Holden Caulfield. I've already mentioned Ernest Gaines' wonderful The Sky is Gray, which I read as a college student and just never got it out of my system. Jane Eyre, Pip, Benji Counts, I think, Bunny, Rufus, Mick, Cosette, Oliver, Frankie, name your own. More recently, um, The Kid and Ian McEwen's Atonement or um, even Randall's Mommy Wada the other night. Um, McCullers said, but the hearts of small children are delicate organs. A cruel beginning in this world can twist th that into, ooh. what? I can't read my writing. <laughs> curious shapes can twist them into curious shapes. The heart of a hurt child can shrink so that forever afterward it is hard and pitted as the seed of a peach. A.G., in the opening of A Death in the Family, speaks of the time that I lived so successfully disguised to myself as a child. His character, Rufus, is such a favorite, the voice and force of a child, childlike in all the believable ways, choosing the most garish of caps, uh, wondering if he can dare to wear it, uh, getting this slight thrill, boasting to the neighborhood children that, yes, his father's the one who's dead, even though it's, it's bringing such mixed, conflicting emotions. Um, and then the way he looks back, that wonderful passage on darkness, which is clearly the older voice looking back at this time of great life loss, coupling a child's very natural fear of the dark and the loss of the lovey object with the adult's greater fear and knowledge of the death of the father and the way this whole time shifts and changes. We've seen a lot of that this week. Dick's character in his story the other night, Morris uh, mentioning Robert Penn Warren and that great long, long ago in Kentucky, I, a boy, stood. Why reach back? Why return? Why open the doors and look? With time, meanings become clearer. With time, you have the power of that great dual vision, then and now, before and after, the very juxtaposition inviting movement, change, friction, energy. And on the page, I'm not saying it always has to be 
your memories exactly, but to keep in mind the memories of your characters, finding those, the information that shapes what is a real life with all the warts and bumps. Um, fear. You're surrounded by parts of a lecture you're afraid to give. Uh, and what's your thought? I want to go home. <laughs> You're lost in the woods, and there's a wolf in Grandma's bed. Thank you, Amina. And what are you thinking? I just want to go home. Home plate, home base, safe. Siri, take me home. That depository of who you were and who you wanted to be and the way you saw the world, you continuously go back there again and again, either to explain something to yourself or to celebrate how you got to the other side or to once again face whatever it is you might not have faced. I really think that to forget what it feels like to be a child is quite simply to forget the really important parts. I'm reassured to see how simply so many at the end of their lives return to that beginning place. The same fears, the same desires. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I want to go home. So I'll read a couple of quotes. This is A.G. How far we all come, how far we all come away from ourselves. So far, so much between, you can never go home again. You can go home, it's good to go home, but you never really get all the way home again in your life. Whatever it was and however good it was, it wasn't what you once had been and had lost and could never have again. And once in a while, once in a long time, you remembered and knew how far you were away and it hit you hard enough that little while it lasted to break your heart. And, I, and um, I'm going to indulge and, and read a little bit of William Maxwell from So Long, See You Tomorrow, one of my favorite passages. Whether they are part of a home or home as a part of them is not a question children are prepared to answer. Having taken away the dog, take away the kitchen, the smell of something good in the oven for dinner, also the smell of washing day, of wool drying in the wooden rack, of ashes, of soup simmering on the stove, Take away the patient old horse waiting by the pasture fence. Take away the chores that kept him busy from the time he got home from school until they sat down to supper. Take away the early morning mist, the sound of crows quarreling in the treetops. His work clothes are still hanging on a nail beside the door of his room, but nobody puts them back on, or puts them on or takes them off. Nobody sleeps in his bed or reads the broken back copy of Tom Swift and his flying machine. Take that away too while you're at it. Take away the pitcher and bowl, both of them dry and dusty. Take away the cow barn where the cats sitting all in a row wait with their mouths wide open for somebody to squirt milk down their throats. Take away the horse barn, too, the smell of hay and dust and horse piss and old sweat, stained leather, and the rain beating down on the plowed field beyond the door. Take all this away, and what have you done to him? In the face of a deprivation so great, what is the use of asking him to go on being the boy he was? He might as well start life over again as some other boy instead. It's fairly common to encounter people in nursing care who simply want to go home. They tell you they're going. They tell you someone will be there any minute to get them. One woman has told me for over a year now that if I will just help her to the end of the hall and out the door, she's pretty sure she can make it across the field and home before it gets dark. I had the good fortune to grow up with a lot of old relatives, and so I've always been drawn to those voices, just as I have the voices of children, pure and uninhibited. Our earliest words, our last words, 
the needs and desires often so similar and not burdened by all the fatty weight and disguises we take on throughout life. The image that comes to my mind so often is how I once saw a little girl, maybe three at the most, overcome by the warmth of the sun. And while her mother was busily talking off to the side, she proceeded to slowly shed her clothes. <laughs> and then, like a little puppy, scampered off to the side to squat and pee before coming back and sprawling out in the warm summer sun. That's where I always want to freeze it. Pure ecstasy, innocence, joy. But unfortunately, here comes her mother, yanked her arm, swatted her leg, wrestled her back into the confines of her clothes, and the whole lovely scene ended in cries and screams, deprivation, injustice. I grew up going to Sunday school, as I said, and for years was terrified by the verse on the wall no one bothered to fully explain to me. I laughed at Kathy's reading the other day with this, a different form of suffer with suffrage, but this, suffer the children to come unto me. The word suffer combined with someone calling you over did not sound good to me at all. In fact, I'm thinking some bad stuff is up ahead. So imagine the great relief when it was finally explained to me that it simply meant allow, let, let the children come, let the children speak. It was, in fact, the opposite of all those other things like you should be seen and not heard. The child's voice is one filled with the imaginings of all that is ahead, and then the voice of old age is all memory and looking back and trying to claim it again with a kind of truth and honesty that binds them together. Do you have to tell everything you know? Do you want the neighbors to hear you? You care more about the neighbors than you care about me. I'll show you who cares. Sometimes my mother has loud days, streams of what sounds like another language rolling out of her, sometimes peppered with words she never would have really said. I sometimes tell her we're in church, and she stops. <laughs> we are? Though the last time I tried this little trick, she said, so what? I have to part here because uh, the way I find her um, when they have these Sunday services, uh, you know, is like a lot of wheelchairs crowded in a room. And usually, I mean, I grew up in a, a, a very rural county, and there's usually a, a Pentecostal preacher just singing and talking. And, um, you know, it's loud and it's lively and it's crowded. But what I'm looking for is my mother um, still is incredibly flexible, and, and she will just put her little leg straight up in the air. And, and so I always give her sort of festive socks or that have animal faces. <laughs> and it, it does remind me of like, you know, kind of a mobile or something up overhead, except she does her feet. And so it's very easy to find her because there'll be like these little hot pink pigs just... <laughs> Waving with whatever's being sung. Um, now I forgot where it was. Oh, she once let loose a string of what sounded like Latin gibberish. Uh, and again, she was, she was a secretary for uh, a pediatric clinic, so she did like dictation for years. She once let loose a string of what sounded like Latin gibberish, only to to learn that she had actually called someone an ear infection as she sought the right words. And all I could picture was her at her desk at the children's clinic, fingers typing a mile a minute while listening to the dictaphone reel off some diagnosis and also answering whatever question I had popped in to ask. Could I have money? Drive the car. Does your car run on gas? Yes. Mine runs on a monogram. Really? Yes, and it works very well. 
She once said of someone, Christine reminded me of this, she once said of someone, she is nothing but a rat trying to be a pronoun. <laughs> May I help you? Do you know who I am? No, I don't think so, but I, I know I've known you for a very long time. I say my whole life. How about that? Almost there. Mama, don't leave me, she says. I won't. Will you be at my school party? Of course. Where, uh, I sometimes imagine who my mother would have been in a simpler, easier life, the sharp wit and eagerness for fun, her talent for playing the piano or for sketching and coloring, which she also loved to do. She always liked to say that she was a Saturday's child and works hard for a living. And I think that the same little girl who cared for and protected her brother, I cut that part, put on the caretaker hat early in life and wore it all the way through. One of my earliest memories of going to school was her stressing that you should always keep an eye on the people who don't get chosen and that when in a position to pick, to remember and try to include those who usually got left out. This was one of her greatest strengths and something she always did. I think I see now that it probably grew out of her own insecurities and perhaps her desire to have been acknowledged and included in ways she had felt left out. She once cried in, a, in, in nursing care because she wasn't sitting at the popular table <laughs> or what she thought was the popular table. There is grace in connecting the dots and seeing the whole pattern of a life and understanding how someone became the person he or she is. Where is your daddy? I was going to ask you. I think he's here, but I'm not sure. Do you think he's here? Yes, yes I do. In those later years, she relaxed. She stopped worrying as much. And now in this alternate universe, she really doesn't care what the neighbors hear. And she says exactly what she thinks in the moment she thinks it. Much of the time, she's so complimentary, praising those who pass up and down the hall. She tells people she loves them, and occasionally she comments on their appearance, but almost always in ways that makes whoever is hearing it laugh. Who is that old man? I don't know, but did you see him? God, he's a mess and old. I like to think that those times we witnessed the curtain lift, she feels it as well, that she feels a very real connection of love and acceptance. Sometimes I will say 802, and she will quickly say East 2nd Street. That's her childhood address, the one my dad helped her find all those years ago. And she follows with something like, my mother is there waiting. Then I say 2401, and she says Riverwood, which is the house where I grew up. Riverwood, that's our house, yes. That's where we are, yes. We're here at home, yes, we are. And I just thought I would um, end just, just a couple of minutes now that I've read all my parts and tomorrow Adrian will tell me how I needed to put them together. Um, but but for, the past, for the past three years, I have done a writing group at, at the facility where my mother lives. And in the beginning, I did it. Um, I really wanted to get the local history of my place, and I, they have given me wonderful material. They actually helped me with the novel I was working on and the train wreck I described. Um, and in the beginning, I thought it was also wonderful for my mother to come and be able to listen to the workshop um, until, you know, like one time too many, she, she after someone read, she said, well, that's shitty. And um, <laughs> so I have not continued to bring her. Um, but... Um, but by, but by then, I was so invested in the group, and those in the group 
were so invested, we've continued. And, and by now, we have lost quite a few people, but we've had new people coming in. And, um, and recently, um, I, I had, I collected their work, and we gave a little public reading. <laughs> the, the local newspaper came and everything. And um, we meet every month. So over the course of time, we, we have really got quite a collection. And I just, um, a lot of the prompts, they're always saying, you know, give me a, give me a prompt. And so um, I have given them a lot of these prompts about home and childhood memories. And so they've done every holiday, they've done their mothers, they've done their fathers. And um, I, I just thought I would give you a sampling. One woman, Norma, um, I tell her that, that her book will be called, We Were So Poor But Thank God We Didn't Know, because that's how she begins every story she tells. And, and it's usually always about, um, I didn't know this wasn't the right car to have. Everybody else had the, you know, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful example of all she learned after the fact, but as a child was very just thrilled to be there. And so this is one of my favorites of hers. When I was a child, money was scarce. There were 11 children in my family. I slept with one of my sisters. In the winter, we had so many quilts on the bed you could hardly turn over. I took my lunch to school, which was usually a biscuit with a slice of fried ham, or we called it middling meat, called bacon today. When I got home from school, we would race to the dining room to get a snack. In quilting time, ladies would be in the den, which at that time we called the big house, quilting. I never did learn to quilt. Students at that time could take pocket knives to school. One day, a boy student at recess was throwing knives at girls' feet, and they would jump back to miss the knife. One day, I refused to jump back, and the knife stuck in my big toe. I did not report him. We used to walk to church on Sunday, sometimes twice a Sunday. Dr. Harden would come to church to give typhoid shots. Everyone tried to be the last one in line to get the shot. Also, we would go in the woods when I was small to make a playhouse. And then it began, they all had that place in the woods they played. And everyone was writing about that. And then I'll just read this one more of Norma's, which, which also um, just embraced and celebrated uh, the Lumber River, which passes through my native county and, and created horrible devastation with Hurricane Matthew a few years ago, but it's a, a beautiful river, and they all just kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. Princess Anne is a part on the river. When I was growing up, Princess Anne was a favorite place to go. We would work hard on the farm to get our work done so we could go to Princess Anne to go in the water. I didn't ever learn to swim. We would go to the edge of the water and wade, I didn't have a bathing suit. I would wear a homemade dress or skirt and blouse to go in the water. I would hold the dress or skirt down until it got real wet so it wouldn't fly up. I had a mischievous cousin that often went with us to the river. He would scare us to death, catching us and ducking our heads under the water. We would almost lose our breath. We would walk down in the woods to change our wet clothes. Some churches held baptizings at Princess Anne, and that is where I was baptized. Some of the boys would swing out on a tree limb and get way out on the river. We also liked to fish. You would catch more catfish than anything, but we liked to catch brim and perch. We always counted them to see who caught the most. I look back now and realize they were the good old days. <laughs> um, and I'll just, they, they, um, it all began very cheerful and happy and sunny, and slowly we have moved in. Three of them have lost children. Um, many have lost spouses. And more and more the conversation um, has turned back to those places or the death of a parent, those places where life 
took a turn. And um, I think I'll stop there because I didn't do a very good job writing my last act. So <laughs> thank you very much.